Thank you everyone for being here on whatever time zone you find yourself. Uh, I know that in Berlin it's evening, late afternoon, evening, it's morning here in Rochester. My name is Zoe Chanel and I'm the curator at the Rochester Center. This talk is that we're having today is part of Chronicles of the Chronic. Yeah, so this talk is part of this group exhibition that celebrates the creativity and resilience of the chronically ill community and it features regional, national, and international artists whose artistic practice reflects holistically upon the experience of living with a chronic health condition. Chronic Health is a Chronic is open until March 31st, and we have open hours from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. every Wednesday to Sunday, so there's still a chance to see the show. I'm here today with Lauren Yudin. She will read from original text, the more I listen to my body, the more I hear screaming. This text was written in the winter that Lauren went through the final process of receiving her diagnosis from fibromyalgia. In, this text includes two versions of a Georgian Pagal lullaby that was sang to sick children. And it's played at the beginning, one at the beginning and one at the end of the reading. There's some content warning that I'd like to be aware of. Uh, ableism, including ableist terminology, childhood trauma, medical abuse, CPTSD, flashback, racism, and misogyny. Without taking more space, I just want to introduce Lauren. She's a um, uh, poet, performance solution artist based in Berlin, originally from Canada, and her practice derives from her research um, and navigation through the medical industrial complex, colonial medicine, alternative healing practices and traditional medicine for the treatment of her chronic illnesses and disability. And by publicly presenting her personal experiences and re-evaluation of history, her work illuminates and advocates for repressed, marginalized and forgotten forms of radical care and crypt knowledge. And we have um, a work that we will talk about of Lauren that it's featured in the show. So now I'm, I'm gonna play one of the the, the lullabies. Oh, 
covered with a red cloth was placed before the sick children. On the cloth, there were little pastries, sweets, cloth scraps in various colors, dolls, flags, red dyed eggs, and so forth. This was a banquet set for the lords and angels. O oh, violet, na na, O oh, rose, na na, O oh, violet, na neo, O oh, you lords, O oh, you merciful ones, O oh, violet, na ni now. I pluck a violet, I spread out a rose, O oh, violet, na ni now. Bring relief to our children, O oh, violet. Nani now. In the garden of the lords, O oh violet, Nani now. A white mulberry is bearing fruit, O oh violet, Nani now. I was at the river bank, and there I saw, O oh violet, Nani now. An aspen wrapped around an aspen, O oh violet, Nani now. We came here from the white sea. O oh, violet, nani now. Seven brothers, seven sisters. O oh, violet, nani now. We spread out to seven towns. O oh, violet, nani now. We pitch our tents in seven towns. O oh, violet, nani now. As your coming made us glad, may your leaving do likewise. Na na, na na to the lords. O oh, Violet, Nani now. I can still feel the prodding fingers of the doctor yesterday in my upper back, shoulders, elbows, hips, and Achilles tendon. Him repeatedly asking me, does this hurt? How about here? Jabbing me again, does this hurt? It was after the third time he got up out of his seat coming towards me from the other side of a large awkward desk to prod his fingers into my body again, that it became clear to me how fragile his authority was in this situation. His entire diagnosis was seemingly tied to only his index finger and a questionnaire that three people were struggling to translate from German into English and answer. The fact that he attributed more authority to his finger and this untranslatable questionnaire than to my own personal account of my body was darkly comical, as is how used to this I am. In her novel, The Yellow Wallpaper, Charlotte Perkins Gilman highlights that diagnosis can covertly function to empower the male physician's voice and disempower the female patient's. The narrator in this novel is not allowed to contribute her own treatment or diagnosis and is forced to succumb to everything that her doctor, and in this particular story, her husband says. The male voice is the one that forces control over the female and decides how she is allowed to, per to perceive and speak about the world around her. 18th century theorists believe that the womb was the cause of women's only illnesses. The expanse of these supposed womb-based illnesses became known as the hysterical passion. In the 1800s, when doctors, rather than midwives or herbalists, began to treat patients, the hysteric woman became a commonplace label for women when the doctor was unable to understand a diagnosis or problem. Women with multiple sclerosis were initially labeled as hysterics, as were women with fever-induced delirium. Even today, people who are ultimately diagnosed with lupus may be accused of exaggeration when they first present their symptoms. This is likely linked to the fact that many of the initial symptoms of lupus, fatigue, achiness, and stiffness, are the same symptoms that doctors noted in hysterical women. Notably, these same symptoms, especially pain and fatigue, are the hallmark of fibromyalgia. The root of the hysteric label seems firmly bound in misogyny, 
an unwillingness to believe that ill women are anything other than a dramatic female behind the patient. In the late 1800s, doctors discredited white, middle, and upper-class women's complaints of chronic fatigue syndrome because they believed that women who did not work had nothing to be tired over. It was also a common belief at this time that hysteria was a result of too much education, that women who spent time in college or studying overstimulated their brains and were consequently leading themselves into states of hysteria. While the history of hysteria has traditionally been told through the lens of gender, it's essential to understand that while sexism and misogyny impacts all women, the experiences of white women are very different to those of, in, of indigenous women, black women, women of color and immigrant or refugee women. Middle and upper class white women had long been a subject of intense scrutiny in the medical field. But within the same field, the racial other was an entirely separate issue in the sense that racial ethnic minorities were rarely seen to matter at all. Indeed, racial ethnic minorities were seldom included in medical analysis, much less the focus of them, unless they were being used as test subjects against their will. Many of the diseases recognized in women were seen as the results of a lack of self-control or self-rule. Different physicians argued that a physician must assume a tone of authority and that the idea of a cured woman is one who is subdued docile, silent, and above all, subject to the will and voice of the physician. A hysterical woman is the one who craves power, and in order for her to be treated for her hysteria, she must submit to her physician, whose role is to undermine her desires. Often, these women were prescribed bed rest as a form of treatment, which was meant to tame them, ridding them of rebelliousness and forcing them to conform to expected social roles. While it is no longer called hysteria, this type of practice still continues today. Instead, these conditions are called somatic or psychosomatic, which are described as any illness that has physical symptoms, but has the mind and emotions as its origin. Whether psychosomatic conditions are physiological or not, what is more important to consider is how this diagnosis is used as a tool for the oppression of all women especially those in minority groups. The racialized stereotype of the angry and emotional woman in particular has helped generate the angry black woman stereotype that relies on the stipulation that black, indigenous, and women of color can exist as long as they do so quietly. The hysterical pigeonhole serves to dismiss, discredit, and deny the minority experience by instructing that their stories are unnecessary emotional responses. Another example of the transformation of hysteria is with the disease fibromyalgia, a well-known physiological disease predominantly found in women today. Because the cause of the disease is not known, it is often characterized by the medical community, courts, and insurers of long-term disability plans as only a psychosomatic illness, leaving many people with this disease without a diagnosis for years suffering in pain with no adequate care, no insurance coverage, and a high risk of ending up in a psych ward instead of being placed in a holistic pain reduction and physical therapy program, all of which inevitably leaves many people at the mercy of the medical industrial complex without any autonomy or self-determination over their own body. I keep expecting at the next opening or social event that when I'm in pain by telling people about it, it might go away. That saying it out loud will prove that I'm making it up, that it is just psychological and that along those lines, if I admit to it, admit its existence to another person, an able body even, it will disappear. Like describing a dream when one wakes up, its texture and threads falling away as they reach your lips, while you're telling it to your lover lying beside you, leaving you with only a loose sense of what happens and emotions that exhaust. The amount of silence I actually have around my illness, though, 
The hiding and pretending I do to act able-bodied is something I don't know when I'm turning off anymore. I don't know when I'm pretending. Am I pretending when I'm at home, when I'm alone? If I'm pretending, then why does the pain continue? Why is it that with each attempt your hands in trying to soothe my tense muscles only cause me more pain? It is because of this that I don't ask for help sometimes. Bearing the weight of someone else's disappointment and not being able to help me can be just as painful as my symptoms. I'm also not the kind of person who is always capable of repaying these kinds of favors. I'm not even sure if I'll be able to repay them. And so out of caring for everyone else, I usually don't ask. I don't ask because it's a taboo. I don't ask because of my job. I don't ask because of losing respect. I don't ask because people will not believe me. I don't ask because I will lose friends. I don't ask because people will be flaky. I don't ask because pretending to be fine is easier in helping me cope. I don't ask because I'll learn the worst sides of people that are closest to me. I don't ask because it puts me in such a vulnerable position. I don't ask because people will give me unsolicited, uneducated advice. I don't ask because it means my experience will be undermined. I don't ask because you really do not care how I am feeling, and you might just take this as an opportunity to talk about yourself. I don't ask because I don't want to have you compare your stress and struggles to mine. I don't ask because I don't want to hear you equate what is causing you stress in your able-bodied life, which is entirely based on the choices you have made and not like me happening due to diseases I never chose to have. I don't ask because I'll be told I'm not doing enough, be given yet another set of instructions on how to fix my chronic illnesses, and be mansplained yet another treatment I've already done or looked into and know more about. I don't ask because I'll be ostracized. I don't ask because people will insult me. But you look so great. You're so productive. I don't ask because I will have to witness the shock, horror, and disgust on people's faces when they hear the word disease and there is no cure. I don't ask because I will hear the same remarks of ableist rhetoric directed towards me over and over again. I don't ask because it hurts to feel like a burden. I don't ask because I hate being portrayed a dumb victim that isn't strong or smart enough to take care of herself. I don't ask because I don't ha want to be seen as complaining, weak, inferior, dramatic, or making excuses. I don't ask because everyone has their own shit to deal with. I don't ask because it will be held against me. I don't ask because I'm not going to give you an award for being there for me and having you feel like you're a better person for it when it is a simple task for you. I don't ask because sometimes I just need to do it for myself. I don't ask because I can't remember what to ask for sometimes. I don't ask because it's exhausting and I have no spoons left. I don't ask because explaining what I need won't benefit you or me. I don't ask because I'm not capable of it in the moment. I don't ask because I'm tired of telling you I'm not fine and you ignoring it. I don't ask because I don't believe anyone actually gives a shit. I don't ask because it sounds like an annoying favor that I can do on my own and like I'm lazy, but I actually don't have the courage to tell you how sick I am. I don't ask because I don't believe I should have to always ask. I believe when people know my condition, they should check in and ask me. I don't ask because I've strategically pushed all my close friendships away due to a fear of rejection and abandonment. I don't ask because I don't think anyone is capable of helping me. I don't ask because I don't want to talk to anyone or don't have the strength to. I don't ask because it's embarrassing. I don't ask because sometimes I'd rather stare at the ceiling until the will to live comes back to me. I don't ask because hurting myself through an afternoon of starvation and the adrenaline high from that can feel a lot better. I don't ask because it's nobody's business. I don't ask because I don't want to lose people in my life. I don't ask because I sometimes think it's pathetic. I don't ask because I don't want to talk about it. I don't ask because it would involve an amount of honesty that hurts others. 
or wakes them up to a reality they are not ready for. I don't ask because I hate watching my friends fail to be as loving as they think they are. I don't ask because I hate having to call them out on being good time friends when they think they are not. I don't ask because I don't know what I can offer back and that maybe I'm a bad time friend and I may never have good times in me. Walking into the U-Bahn, as usual, a man is playing saxophone. I'm waiting for the U-8 and trying not to think about the fact that I haven't replied to my mother's text. I'm trying to avoid feeling guilty about it and about setting boundaries with her. This is when I begin to hear him play somewhere over the rainbow. This lullaby haunts me and it's as if while thinking about and avoiding her, she sent this song request to him. Her usual codependent gestures making me feel even worse than before. And then I realize I can't even remember her voice or the twinkle of the music box that she would play while singing this song to me now. I can still hear it now, and as I grew up, I would listen to that music box, eventually learning the lyrics to then sing this song to myself when in need as a kind of self-soothing. I sang, closing my tear-filled eyes, imagining the possibility of being happy, that by singing the lyrics or humming the melody, the song would take me far away from my isolated circumstances, that I would open my eyes to an actual brighter world, some place where there isn't any trouble, behind the moon, beyond the rain, I don't remember when I stopped singing this song, and at this moment, I don't really care to know why. But instead, standing here on the platform, I just want to cry, and I want to sing. And as I imagine singing this song to myself now, a gentle, soothing hum escapes my lips, and I can see my old bedroom, myself on the floor staring at the ceiling, my arms wrapped around me. I begin to grieve for my body and my mind. I begin to grieve for my lost childhood and for the child that is still in me that is heartbroken and scared. The train arrives and I snap back into my body. The twinkle of the music box fades. I grip my cane, finding a sense of comfort in its stability and walk on to the train. The Ivnana is a genre of Georgian folk song known famously today as pop song lullabies, but historically sung as a healing songs for sick children. On the occasions in which the Ivnana was sung, the lullaby is addressed not to the sick child, but rather to the spirits known as lords or angels who are believed to be possessing the child and causing the illness. Although their visit might very well result in the death or permanent disfigurement of the sick child, these lords were believed to have come down from heaven. Therefore, they must be treated with appeasement, especially in hopes of a positive outcome. So the family would refrain from outward signs of distress or indeed from any activity that might irritate the powerful, potentially lethal supernatural beings that had come into their home. And as, as long as the child remains ill, the household members avoided conflict, loud or angry speech, sexual intercourse, the slaughtering and cooking of food, the lighting of fires except for candles, and most forms of domestic labor. The child was fed for the most part bland dairy-based foods regardless of the illness and spicy and salty dishes, alcoholic beverages, and certain meats were not to be eaten out of respect to the spirits. Furthermore, the visiting lords were to be entertained by the household during their stay. The child was wrapped in red blankets and bathed in red light. The sick room was decorated with red-colored fabrics and had a banquet of food and sweets. Candles were lit, Sweet-smelling incense was burnt, and the family members danced, played instruments, and sang the Ivnana. I feel my mother's hands on my shoulder, wanting to brush my hair, my small body at the age of nine tensing, 
my long hair first softly brushed, then suddenly ripped out of my head at the first encounter of a knot the brush catches. My mother pulls at it, expecting to, through pure force to have it break and come apart. I sit there pretending I'm not in pain as she continues to rip my hair out. A knot of hair hangs from the brush in her hand. I smile. In 1998, the ACE study explored adverse childhood experiences, surveying 17,000 middle-income adults who had health data stretching back to their early childhood. The ACE research indicated that the more adversity is an individual experienced as a child, poverty, parental death, or incarceration, neighborhood violence, or abuse, the more likely that the person would suffer from serious psychological disorders as an adult. While the casualty between childhood adversity and adult chronic illness has yet to be fully determined, researchers now have enough knowledge about the way chronic stress impacts physiological health to make some educated guesses about their potential link. When the flight or fight response remains highly activated in a child for an extended period of time, without the calming influence of a supportive parent or adult figure, Toxic stress occurs and can damage crucial neural connections in the developing brain. According to Harvard Center on the Developing Child, the impacts of experiencing repeated incidents of toxic stress as a child persist far into adulthood and lead in to lifelong impairment in both physical and mental health. Claws digging into my arms dragging deeper into the flesh the more I pull away, as if stuck like a cat's claws in cloth. Hi, my mother texts me. Just hi, nothing more, just hi. With that one text, I could write a novel, a novel solely composed of all of her needs, the needs she is using one word to express, the need she is ignorantly but firmly holding me responsible for. The anger this brings with it is complicated by a claustrophobic sense of never being far away enough from the weight of having been her caregiver and never having my own. When a sick child succumbed to a disease during the visitation of the lords and angels, mourning was strictly forbidden since the victim was thought to have been taken by the angels. The Georgian Academy of Sciences collection of Georgian folk poetry lists over 60 lullabies. In the chapter Cradle Songs, 16 were specifically performed in the presence of children suffering from smallpox, measles, scarlet fever, or other infectious diseases. It was believed that the child taken by the lords and angels goes to paradise, is an angel, and will be with the angels like the shrine built in the home around the child. Its coffin would be painted red and sprinkled with roses.
Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. <laughs> that was a pleasure. I prepared uh, a few questions for Lauren. Thank you again for, for gifting us with this reading. I'm a big fan of your work and just very happy that one of your pieces is part of the Chronicles of the Chronic show. Uh, because I have to say much of your writing and your work inspires some of the ideas for the show. I am very interested in like how you bring things together. Like the works that I've seen of you are kind of like this sort of ontology of knowledge, uh, but poetic around illness and healing. And they seem to be often presented as a curated stream of thoughts. Um, you have references like books or the folk songs in this case of the reading that we just we just witness. TV shows sometime, meme culture, they're like part of the work. They're very visible. And they pull from so many different kind of cultures, Western classical culture, meme culture, and more. And they're also interwoven with your personal history. So I guess my question here is, um, how do you form those connections and the sort of like collection of things that are very from, from various places and, and fields, right? Yeah, I um, wish I had like a more interesting answer to give to this because I think my answer is like really boring, but it's just, I'm just really collecting from uh, my day-to-day -day life and um, even, I guess, for example, like the Georgian songs, uh, I was, when I won the Berlin Art Prize, part of the award was doing a residency in Tbilisi in Georgia. And it was just like a lucky happenstance that the residency was also a part of the like medical museum of Georgia. And part of that was then an introduction to the Ivnana and a lot of other histories, um, like Georgian histories of medicine and religious practices and, and spiritual practices that like go back to like the beginning of human civilization, basically. So that's kind of how like a lot of things just come by me through these like very fortunate, uh, lucky things. But then I, I guess it's just this practice of like, I think even just part of being neurodivergent is that you are always constantly looking for patterns and connections and forming lines and making sense of a lot of things. And yeah, and it's while my, uh, I have a like due to fibromyalgia and a lot of other things, I have a terrible short-term memory. So I think my memory works in this other kind of way now so that I had the act of collecting, the act of connecting different things together and creating these kinds of networks like allows for a type of other memory making for me. And then that's basically my art practice. <laughs> And then ends up being developed into these texts or into sculptures. Uh, it's so interesting thinking about, yeah, like ways, yeah, ways to function, like sort of ways to function in society and like being creative about that, right? Like memory mm -hmm. making through this. Uh, if you want to add something to that, like feel free. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's like a part of um, like the act of collecting is both like, yeah, memory making for myself, but also, I mean, the main baseline of my practice and then just how I survive is just collecting so many different ways of practicing care or receiving care, different forms of medicine taking or different approaches. So, I mean, that is kind of the baseline and then everything else becomes like a lot more, yeah, like say collecting lullabies for sick children, like that is, it does extend into like the category of historic forms of treatments yeah so that very much becomes then also this kind of like bringing it into the personal and how have lullabies impacted me in my life or how has a kind of belief of religion impacted my life and my care and the the concepts of what people think about the diseases that I have and then how I incorporate my own kind of spiritual practices in the in a sense as well yeah, and I think I 
I, I think your work speech speaks very much to this idea of like, I mean, when the medical system decide that there's no cure or there isn't like a science to a cure yet, right? Like, <laughs> what are you supposed to do, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Other than figure so, out how to like treat your symptoms or like, yeah, I mean, I have a very like re like attitude of like looking back into the past and being like, okay, like where can I find similar things? How how were they treated in different cultures or um, different parts of the world? How were they approached in other ways? Because sure, maybe there aren't cures, but um, there are always other approaches. Who knows if they're right or wrong or if they work or not, but it's better to have like a holistic approach to many parts of this information and history than just a few doctors in the medical industrial complex saying a few things when it's very clearly like a medical system that hasn't been around for a very long time. Yeah, in, in my opinion, hasn't been around for a very long time. So, and is still very much a developing system. So they're not going to have all the answers. My segue question to that was kind of, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, similar. There's presence of thinking about how history is made, right? And that's kind of also the, one of the idea of the show, so just the name of it, Chronicles of the Chronic, like Chronicles being something that it's written, like a big event that was recorded somehow, right? And I think, as you mentioned, as as it's spoken about in in your uh, the piece that you just read, there is so much that has been kind of unrecorded within the history of illness, pain, and disability, and so many other things that really need to be revised and rewritten from other perspectives that uh, are the people dealing with the thing, right? And then there is like all the, yeah, holistic. My holistic approach is because I don't have a better word in English for it, right? But I was wondering, um, what is there like any lineage, any like tradition or multiple traditions and lineages uh, that you want your work to be kind of in conversation with? I feel like uh, how how dare I like suggest that my work is in lineage with like, like that would be such an honor <laughs> for my work to be like a part of that. But I think I... Even just when I started writing or like how the practice came to me was just thinking about like auto theory. Yeah, auto theory illness. I'm not I'm not saying the term correctly right now, but basically just like a lot of people like the book that I um, referenced, The Yellow Wallpaper. I think there's a lot of poetry just coming from a lot of women, femmes that were writing about their personal experiences and that very much informing a subjective kind of history writing and like perspectives on care and, and medication or medicine like and treatment that has paved the way for like a lot of contemporary writing practices. I don't know. I think I always just come from that point of view, actually, even though I know it's like I'm a artist that makes objects, but I think I always just, my I'm always coming from reading something and researching some kind of context or history or just poetry. So the way that approach happens is like very natural for me. But then when I, I think when it comes to like actual sculptural works and like artists, like of course I think of like being in context with like the contemporary like crip and like like chronically ill and disabled community. I think even, I don't know, like, going back to Frida Kahlo like there's just like these classic figures though I really like to find myself in the work of a lot of artists or even writers creatives that maybe not necessarily identified or would identify as chronically ill or crip but that like mental illness is a very big part in their work like even just right I've been in the last year really into like the work of Mike Kelly and like very important, prominent figure. The discussion around his mental illness is always there is particularly like even the way that he passed away, like it's there, but it hasn't like there's still room, which I think is very exciting for crypt dialogues around people's work, much like, yeah, like Mike Kelly or even like Tracy Emmons, like which I think is a very good person to look at for like 
bringing in the personal, like her whole practice is incredibly personal, but then there being a lot of, yeah, like it's turbulent. There's mental illness. There's like stuff that has to be worked through. It's incredibly powerful work that says a lot of important things. It's also like that part of like illness, not curable, right? Like you're trying to find something in other places, even when it's not screaming, like this is for sick people, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think <laughs> like to, or I guess I just have this kind of thing in trying to like work through my own, like inter- internalized ableism. I think I just like really like to take an approach to every part of life and just really kind of be able to look at other people's work or other people in my life that I care about or anybody and just kind of remove this barrier that first comes with like, oh, if you're sick, bad. You know, if you remove this and you're just like, oh, wait, this person is clearly, I'm just going to use Mike Kelly as an example. So then it's just like, this person was clearly going through some mental illness equals chronically ill or mental illness. And, um, and that's not a bad thing. I think it's just like, there's just so much more room for like a very interesting dialogue to happen. Or I think it's very limiting to chronically ill and disabled artists to just have them belong to this one category, like any other artist. like if we're, there's movements which are important and say a lot. And I think that is happening with like the topics of care right now. It works against like any kind of artist to just limit them to just the illness or um, that they're working with, like that works can also stand on their own. And I think there can be other openings of dialogue when looking at other artists, creatives, whatever, in a crip perspective. I I think that's really amazing. I just really see it in a way of like opening things rather than limiting. Yeah, because then you can just tie so many more histories and and things together. I think it's just in the same way of, uh, for me, maybe this is like a really strange tangent, but just um, looking at like any kind of historical figures that in the past were maybe seen as like just a normal figure, but then you find out like, oh, they were queer. And then there's this like whole history that opens up about this person and every and like new meanings as to why they were doing things that they were doing. The, so many things can like open up. I'm referring here to the work that is in the exhibit in the show, which is a photo series from an installation that uh, I got to experience in Bolzano in a show uh, last year, maybe. We are happy to like have in the show as uh, this photo series of like a larger project. There's all these objects and there's all these different sort of meaning symbols attached to some of those objects. Some are more personal. Some are objects that can be bought, right? In 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 series and and some is data, some it's a gift, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I look at those objects, I just like think about this idea that illness and wellness they seem to be like this polarizing thing. Like you're sick, you're not right, or you're doing well, you're not doing right, right? And looking at those objects, I just wonder if do they somehow suggest that it's more of a spectrum or it's a blend of of things. Yeah, I I think that's exactly what, like, so much of the, I guess, what happens when you see, like, the, especially these works together, or actually all of mine, like, you see that there is, like, a huge blending of so many different opinions or concepts or ideas or approaches is the word I'm looking for to what you're saying. Yeah, I think even with these photographs already, like, the framed document is just this, like, silly piece of paper yeah it's just the like test results that I got that basically informed me that I have fibromyalgia which the only way that you can currently be tested for it is just testing for everything else I have nothing else therefore I have fibromyalgia with all of my symptoms the letter then like yeah, you can just get so much in like a few documents or items is that this letter was from my next door neighbor during the first lockdown during Corona. And it was them just being like, hey, we know you're ill. Let us know if we can help with anything. And this is like a neighbor that I've never really had a full conversation with, especially in Germany. There's a certain kind of there's a neighborly vibe that is not entirely friendly all the time. So a letter like this can come a really long way. Yeah, just the way that 
neighborly care is shown here can be much different in kind of basically giving people a lot of privacy rather than extending a, a like very thoughtful tender letter like this yeah and then I, I don't know I'm like very drawn to the to the snake in in this piece and thinking about how it's like both it's, it's like it's a the medieval symbol it's the symbol for like great classical western medicine and it's both contained both like the antidote and the poison both to be found within something we have one question by Jackie Yudin. My thoughts on like person first language versus identity first language. Okay, my brain is not processing that entirely right now, but like this is kind of saying like I'm a person with disabilities. I think each person should just decide how they feel about that themselves. But I very much in a kind of public bureaucratic institutional sense, but basically saying like a person with disabilities, I think is always is always like more respectful. It's, I think it also just in Germany, the way that it is approached as well is like another kind of layer. So I've just kind of gotten used to that. And that is also like, if you, you have to say a person with disabilities, otherwise it's just, uh, you're insulting someone. Like it's a, it's a derogatory term if you don't say it like that. Um, so this has also just become a part of my natural <laughs> way of going about it. But I, I don't think, I don't know, in all of these kinds of like new languages about how to speak with others, I think it's always just to like approach it with patience and learning and, and ask who you're talking to, what they prefer. I was exposed to person first language um, maybe 30 years ago and hey. recently did an equity training where they talked about identity first language being a strong preference of some people. And I was just really surprised. I had not encountered that, but that might just be a US phenomenon because yeah, we're weird here. I mean, I think I think what you brought up about language and like where the language is situated and who you are in relation to that, there's a lot of learning, especially if your native language is something else. And then it's an evolution and we we're trying to figure it out. So trying to be kind to each other might just be the yeah. way right yeah, yeah and I think there's always it takes a long time for certain words that are particularly like around illness and disability that we know like we're I mean even when I was like a child um certain words were slang and maybe used as like slightly insulting which are now like we do we know not to be using these words we 100% understand how harmful they are and mm -hmm. So I think that is also just a process of like being, yeah, gracious with ourselves and like being really open to if someone is like, hey, that's not how I like to be spoken to or um, how or spoken about. I just like to be like, if, if someone wants to correct me, then I'm very happy that they're going to correct me. I want to hear, I, I always want to address someone in the way they want to be addressed. Why wouldn't you? I, you know, I can't speak upon everybody. <laughs> no, no. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. My experience is that many people who experience disability, like myself, prefer to call ourselves disabled. I feel most comfortable reclaiming the word disabled. I say queer has become a term that many queer people prefer and are slur. I also find it awkward for organizations led by people who are not disabled policing their preference for person first language. In a professional context, I tend to use both. When I speak to myself, I use identity first language. And thank you, Alison, for sharing yeah, that. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. I also want to add, like, I very much use the word, like, the term crip, which is, like, I guess technically new, but that is, like, a very place of pride for me. And, and also using the word disabled, like, that is, I think... Like, even as I was kind of speaking earlier and trying to think of like other artists that may have not self-labeled themselves as disabled or chronically ill, like in that same way, if I'm like, oh, that person like might have been categorized, like you could say that they were part of the chronically ill or crip family, I would never want to, like, to me, that's a celebration. Like, that's an exciting thing. 
we need to have another talk about language <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, it will sound just be, like that. not the best one to be like, another a full that. conversation no but thank you for sharing your thoughts about it and thank you everybody for participating and again for gifting us with this reading Florin, and just being able to experience more of your work and if you find yourself to be in Minnesota, come see the show before it closes. If not, to go see Lauren's work. What is the next place where we can experience yeah. your work? Yeah, next is uh, Luckenwalde, which is like a Evac Luckenwalde, which is just outside of Berlin. I'll be doing a performance there in May, a different performance in Vienna following that, and then another one back in Berlin. A lot of performances in Europe. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Bye.